Are you ready to go, Lucy? I am. <laughs> and I understand from Tom, you can see my slides. So that sounds good. Does that sound right? All I can say is I didn't hear anything Bill said and only half of what he said could be true. Cause I was like, so um, the important thing about being here today, I was asked to come and talk about Olmsted in this bicentennial year. And I thought there shouldn't be one voice talking about this most important person. And I'm so excited that both Bill Mann and Spencer Tunnell are joining me in this conversation. And I don't, because I, I couldn't hear what Bill said. I think one of the reasons I was you know, willing to come back and talk about Olmsted, because I, I think I've been in Georgia before saying some of these things, but I've had the privilege in the last year to be doing a statewide survey in Connecticut of the work of the Olmsted firm. And I don't know if it came out of what Bill said, but I grew up in Connecticut. And when I came down to the University of Georgia, even though I had been in the state, you know, many, many years at that point, and certainly been into New York many times and visited Central Park, I didn't know till I got to the University of Georgia and took my first sort of um, history of landscape class that Olmsted was from Connecticut. And I was like, oh, wow, this bond that I shared with him. But in finishing my undergraduate degree at Georgia, I went to Atlanta to work because that's where all the jobs were. And a very prescient of young of Olmsted who saw Atlanta as, as a place of future work. But so in, in my career, I have always been fascinated by both Olmsted and historic landscapes. And I did think I, I did say, hear Bill say that I had the privilege of doing work just as I was coming back to graduate school with the Neil Reed Research Fellowship from the um, Garden Club in Atlanta. I looked at the work of the Olmsted firm in Georgia, the residential work, and discovered so many things as a young practitioner that were that were relevant to me. That you know, the Olmsted firm suffered many of the same trials that I was suffering as a young landscape architect. The people didn't want to pay their bills. They didn't really understand the work that they were trying to accomplish. And it just and I, and I think it's so important to know that that all the things that you probably are experiencing as a student and you will experience soon as a young professional, this has been gone through before and that um, the Olmsted firm kind of did it first. So, um, and in, so in looking at this work in Connecticut, that's really what I wanted to focus on because I think it's so relevant to our world today. And I think the first thing that was an absolute discovery to me, I think I never really thought about that in the same way we're 200 years out from Olmsted's birth, his family, when he was born, was already in Hartford, Connecticut for 200 years, that there are three Olmsteads who had come from the Massachusetts Bay Colony to establish a first Connecticut colony around Hartford in the Connecticut River Valley, which was something I really never understood. I mean, I'd certainly read the biographies and read he was sixth generation and things like that in Hartford. But when I really thought about the fact that, you know, 200 years before his birth, his family had come to this new world and made this trek to a place um, largely undiscovered. The Dutch had gotten there and they were in Hartford is at the site of a, a small Dutch fort. But that when Olmsted was born, and I put that in a quote here on the slide, he never saw a native landscape in Connecticut. 200 years, and fewer than 200 years after his birth, the state had already been completely cut over and really was you know, especially in the Connecticut River Valley, an agricultural setting that these two images from um, a, a mid 19th century illustrator of New England shows two little towns, Newington and Litchfield in Connecticut of, this is the scenery that Olmsted grew up with, that he didn't, I mean, Connecticut, if you visit today is much more grown up. I think it's 60% forest cover, not the original forest cover in any way, but certainly a more forested state than Olmsted would have ever seen. And I think, you know, in trying to understand what shaped Olmsted, because that's one of our challenges with this project is, you know, what about Connecticut made Olmsted Olmsted? And one of these would be this early landscape. And then I think the next thing is his studies. And I think if for anyone who's done any work on Olmsted, you've read that you know, he was a peripatetic young man. His father was a store owner in Hartford, a, a successful store owner. And Frederick Olmsted was his first son and followed very soon after by a second son, John Hall Olmsted. And then at, right after that, his mother died very uh, dramatically with a 
a drug overdose she was taking for a toothache. It was a mistake and, um, and died really in front of young Olmstead. And he never really settled into school. The father remarried and it may have been the, that, that woman that his father remarried from Hartford um, witnessed his mother's death. It was a good friend of hers. And whether she felt uncomfortable that you know, she, her role in the family, she sort of sends Olmstead off to school as a, as a child. And he goes to many schools without really getting much more of an education than he was a great reader. And when it was his turn to go to Yale, which would have been the school that he was being sent to, he developed an eye infection. That's also that great story about Olmsted is that he did not attend Yale when he should have, and but but was pursuing through contacts and um, connections in Connecticut other professions and. The one that I think is most important to his career was he wanted to be a farmer and not just a farmer. I think when, one of the things I, I hope our study changes about Olmsted is that he's often referred to as an experimental farmer, but I'll argue that in following his brother to New Haven, um, who he had started school, uh, Frederick Olmsted became a great friend of his brother's friends in New Haven, and he gets his father to buy him a farm in Satcham Head, Connecticut. He attends the first school of science, really, in the United States. The Sheffield School at Yale is the first science school. Uh, if you know the history of our education system, it's modeled on um, these first universities on the British system. And like Harvard, Yale follows soon after, and it's a divinity school. And they really only teach the classic Latin, Greek, but the Sheffield School headed up by um, uh, Silliman and other men, this is the first place that they're experimenting with all kinds of things, not just um, rubber is discovered through their sciences and Goodyear is from Connecticut. I mean, it's really just amazing what happens here. But that Olmsted is studying there with men who are going to Europe to look at what uh, farming is there. So not only does Olmsted get his first farm right there near New Haven, he is also prodded, I think, by example, to, to look at what other people are doing. And so when his brother, who has already contracted tuberculosis, is being sent to England as sort of a see if he can get well, travel with friends, Olmsted becomes frantic that the brother is going to a place he's desperate to see. And he manages to secure a commission to go and look at farming in England and Europe and bring that information back. As, and I think that's really largely a part of the studies he's doing at Yale as a, um, not, a not a full student, but a student there. And I, in rereading Olmsted's Walks and Talks of an American Farmer that he wrote in 1854, um, I was recognizing that within the first two days of his landing in Liverpool, he basically sees the future of his work. And in addition to sort of being surprised at the very um, strong, strong and developed port that Liverpool is, unlike New York, where he'd seen these rickety wood, you know, um, port and, and development, Liverpool is built of stone and he's, he's impressed by the construction at the port. But more than that, he is shocked and dismayed by these Irish famine immigrants that he is seeing at the port. If we know he's going there in 1854, this is sort of the end of the Irish famine that had started in the 1840s. And he knows of those same people having arrived in New York and Boston and other major ports in the United States. And he is, he is very upset to see these people who he, he sees as, you know, well, they're diseased, um, um, challenged by not being cared for. And, and he just, and it's sort of like this bad start to his trip. But as he sets off with his brother and friend to, to leave Liverpool, he's challenged to go see a new place, Birkenhead Park. And they said, oh, before you leave and head off, you should really cross the Mersey River and go see this new development, this residential community, the center of which is considered the first 
public park in England, maybe the, one of the first public parks in the world that was developed as a centerpiece to this residential development. But the park itself was free to everyone. And the story, and as Olmsted tells it, he leaves after a, a, a breakfast at a, a bakery. The, the baker is very kind and keeps their bags and off they go. And in, in sort of opposition to this first shocking experience, he is again overwhelmed by a designed landscape, something that he's never really experienced. He certainly has seen the beauty of an agricultural um, vernacular landscape as Hartford is growing in that area around him. But this is something entirely different. It is shaped by, um, gosh, and his name just went out of my head, the, the designer of, of Birkenhead Bark, and anyone knows, chime in and tell me. Um, but all these different settings, and he's amazed by the quality of the work and the, and, and the whole sequence of experiences that happened in this park, um, in this place, and that, and as the, the um, picture I have illustrates, all the different people are there. And he recognizes that in this public park, there is a mingling of all, we'll, we'll use the word classes, all people that he could recognize of being of different wealth and, and um, place in the community are allowed to be there at the same time. And he witnesses students playing in the fields and games and, and families traveling together and even poor, um, what he would consider poor families enjoying the same space. And it really, it really has a great impact on him. And the third experience is in leaving Birkenhead the next day and entering into the English countryside, he is overwhelmed by this spring day, this green, and, and Spencer was describing the scene outside your windows there at school, this verdant landscape, agricultural landscape that he is just mesmerized by. He is by descent an Englishman. He knew his home. He actually visited when his ancestral home in England. But this place he's longed to see is, is a place of great beauty. And I would say in those three experiences, he pretty much defines a person that he will become. And, and I say that because he is a person of conscience that Olmsted from the beginning, and I think this was talked about if anyone, I, th I think Spencer I know was there, but if anyone else got to the lecture that was given last night by Rolf Diamond at the Atlanta History Center, talking about Olmsted's role in the founding of the National Park Service, that Olmsted was looking for a profession that it would allow him to do to, to begin to make American civilization something. He didn't know what his career would be, but he saw this great country. And, 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 and I think one of the things about Olmsted that we don't understand either is that he was fairly well-traveled for a young man of his age, that in addition, before he got to England, his father had allowed him to go on a package ship to China. And even though he didn't get off the ship for very long, he had an amazing sort of trip around, you know, um, South America and the oceans and had come back almost dead, but he makes it back and sees things that, you know, very few people had seen at that time. And that one of the great experiences of his youth was traveling with his father and his stepmother and seeing the various landscapes of New England. And he was always impressed by that as his father was. But then after his successful travels to England, he becomes known as this great observer and travel writer, which was an important sort of role in the 19th century because people knew places by what people wrote about them. And being very disturbed by what he was hearing as we moved into the late 1850s about a, 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 a division in this country between North and South and what it would mean to have enslaved labor versus, you know, contract labor at mills that are growing up all over New England. And he knows what labor there looks like. He takes the, he, offers and promotes himself as someone to go south, that he realizes people are talking about things that they've never seen or really know, and makes three trips to the south. I mean, you can see by the map below how much territory he covers. And it's only because of maps he draws after these trips that, you know, it's said that, you know, England did not come in on the side of the south because he could show by his maps of sort of the quality of, 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 
of what labor was getting them, the, you know, that the numbers of people and what was produced wasn't anything like that was being claimed and that this free labor of the North was a much more productive economy than the, than the economy of the South. And, and with that, wait, I'm looking at the wrong things. Um, you know, that Olmsted, again, another group of experiences, doesn't know what he's going to do with that, but goes back north and, and leaves his farm in Satcham's head actually very quickly after he comes back from England and buys a, a farm with his father's help on Staten Island, which is interesting. You know, we don't, Staten Island is not Staten Island of the 19th century. And it's there that he makes some incredible contacts that this is another theme in Olmsted's life. It's not just that he has a conscience about the world he's growing up with. He has connections and contacts throughout his life that are meaningful. And I was just reading that a neighbor in Staten Island, the Minturns, um, it is Robert Brown Mintern who writes the anonymous letter to the Journal of Commerce in New York saying after his travels in Europe that New York would never be a great city. It's growing at leaps and bounds, but, with, but it will never be a great city if it doesn't establish a park, that he has seen these parks happening in Europe and thinks that this would be the future. And, and Olmsted just happens to be in the right place at the right time with connections where he has actually started it as a job as sort of a, a, a developer of a park yet to be designed. And he meets an architect, Calvert Vox, and together with sort of a, sort of a nod from people he knows in New York that he could compete in this design competition, wins the award for the Greensward plan that eventually became his first project in Central Park. I think the important thing about that is, you know, the theme here is the design of Central Park is genius. There's no question that Fox and Olmsted do something there that had never been done in this country before, but it would not have been his profession. I mean, he, if the Civil War breaks out very soon thereafter, he is the secretary of the sanitary commission because he had been injured in Central Park and had a limp and couldn't serve, but he starts the sanitary commission, has his experience, he's a workaholic, he is almost done in by the Civil War and, and leaves that job to go to California. And while he's there working for this Mariposa mine, he travels and, and has another sort of life altering experience at Yosemite Valley. He's told to go see a landscape unlike anything else he's seen. And because of that experience, writes a book about, you know, the very famous treatise there, the Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove, a preliminary report in which he describes that it will be this country's success if they come together to set aside places like Yosemite. These landscapes that are unlike anything else he's seen in the public good. And this is um, you know, another thing that distinguishes Olmsted from really any other professional in the day. I'm gonna hurry along here because we're gonna come back. There's so much to talk about. But then Olmsted, the park maker, that is his probably most important aspect of his work. But I want to say to all of you, the one thing that I think is often missed is, you know, as you notice, I'm not talking about the aesthetics of these places, which is where often where we focus our time. It is the engineering, the environmental engineering of this work. And I'm showing Prospect Park and the Back Bay Fens in 1890. Olmsted was solving the problems of his day through landscape, that parks were these places in the United States that he imagined that we would bring these new immigrants, these people who didn't know this country together to make them part of a, as he described, a civilization, a, a, a place of value and worth. And I, and that, you know, it is, it, it is his underlying theme of his, of his conscience that comes out in his landscape architecture. And that in addition to these parks that he has, once the success of uh, Central Park, Prospect Park, and then um, and, and the word gets out about these amazing new types of landscape. These are absolutely new things that people had not seen before. He is asked by every, almost every city in the United States to come and do the same thing. And I think the other important thing about Olmsted that you know, I want to impress, and I'm sure other people have impressed before, but to take away, the takeaway is Olmsted never did the same project twice. You can find similarities around his work in terms of scenery and 
curvilinear roads, going off the grid, embracing nature in a way that makes you even wonder if a designer had been there, but he's never answering, you know, he's brought there to do things he's done before and he leaves doing something new. And I, and you'll see, and you'll hear this in the work that Spencer will talk about in Druid Hills, there's a slide there, but to, you know, sort of keep going here, um, that he is always looking beyond the question asked and one of his great projects, the U.S. Capitol grounds, this, this place that defiled on January 6th, but this landscape, this garden, this place that would, that would define America, he worked on for almost 30 years and was of great importance to his thinking about this country and why we would create this kind of scene or this setting for a building for all to come and see. And then, you know, something that I'm sure if you haven't gone, it's not that far away, you must see is the Biltmore Estate. And I think one of the things that, you know, doing work on Olmsted that I think is so important to take away, it is not for the design of the home grounds, the landscape that, you know, the pretty landscape in the picture there, that this is a National Historic Landmark. This is a National Historic Landmark because Olmsted sold a young Vanderbilt on the idea of gathering up 70,000 acres to create the first national forest. And through people like Shank and Gifford Pinchot, also from Connecticut, this is the first place where the American landscape is beginning to heal. This cut over woodland or you know, this old growth forest that had preceded Vanderbilt's buying it, Olmsted and his professionals begin to plant back. And that's the reason Buildmore is a National Historic Landmark. These gardens that is, as beautiful as they are, they are, they are, we'll say, imitations of things as beautiful throughout Europe, but no place had an individual under the direction of someone like Olmsted purchased that kind of acreage for the good of all the country. And our first national forest, Piscan National Forest, is, is a Vanderbilt sort of sail back to the United States of those acres. And I think the other important thing about his work is the great sort of exposition in Chicago, 1893, the Chicago Columbian Exposition, not for the fair that took place over two years that brought millions to Chicago, but this is where, because of Olmsted and the architects he worked with there, this became a vision for the cities in America and the pictures around here, this, this growing topsy across the United States suddenly engages people in this design landscape to go back to their home places and think again about what their own towns and cities looked like because of the work of the Olmsted firm. So why don't we, and then, of course, you know that he had a stepson, son, John Charles Olmsted, who comes into the practice as a young professional, and then his own son, Frederick Olmsted, who, who also joins the firm and cuts his teeth in Chicago and at Biltmore at, at these last great projects of his father, and then takes the firm you know, growing the firm to over a hundred people in Brookline, Massachusetts and lasting well into the mid, you know, 20th century, which is just remarkable. So um, let's just put that next slide. So, so again, what we're talking about here, and I think with this slide, turn it over to um, Spencer and let him talk about his project. We can come back and talk about what it means, but these are designed historic landscapes. These are places that are created by a person or group of people. And I will say in the Olmsted, when we talk about Olmsted now, we do not talk about an individual Frederick Olmsted. We talk about all the people that he worked with both in his own life and, and through his firm, the many professionals who that firm gathered together, some staying for their full careers, some leaving that firm and starting their work in other places because of projects that took them out of the firm Example, William Lyman Phillips in Florida went in and out of the firm and then finally had a full professional uh, career of his own in Florida and defined the Florida landscape in some people's minds because of his connection to the Olmsted firm and there are other people like that. So there's something um, you know, else that's distinct about this person, this work. So Spencer, why don't you take it from here and talk about a particular project in Atlanta. Uh, or I can just welcome Atlanta. Um, so this is Atlanta 1892. As you saw from uh, 
uh, Lucy's talk. Um, this is very close to the end of his career, and so you know, there's a whole there's hours to talk about Riverside and Druid Hills. Riverside was the first design uh, suburb of Olmsted, and Druid Hills is the is the last. So as a bookend, it's really a valuable. I mean, there, there's thesis topics right there. Anybody? Anybody? Um, so this is Atlanta in 1892. If you've been to Atlanta lately, it's a lot bigger than this. So this, the bullseye in the center of this red circle is what's called the zero mile post. Uh, and that is generally considered the historic center of the city. It's where the first railroad line ended in the city called Terminus. So um, the top road right here on this grid is 6th Street. Anybody know 6th Street? So Piedmont Park is roughly, will end up being here. Um, the famous town of Buckhead that was trying to be the breakaway republic of Atlanta um, isn't even on the map. Um, but the, the center of the Cathedral St. Philip in Buckhead would be built there eventually, and that is the trace of Peachtree Road, which at that point is just a country road. This is the 1,400 acres that Joel Hurt, an amazing entrepreneur, has purchased between Decatur and Atlanta. And you can see that Druid Hills, the, the land, and it was originally the Kirkwood Land Development Company, is about 70% of the entire uh, area of the city of Atlanta. So the, there is an enormous audacity in the, uh, in the undertaking that Joel Hurt has. He also had designed um, and built a neighborhood called Inman Park that is about here. And, and, and it is, um, anybody been to the bar area of Edgewood? Anybody? No show of, okay, very nice, very nice. Church, you've been to, you've been to church on Edgewood, yeah, right. So Edgewood was a street that Joel Hurt built to get to Inman Park, and it was served by a trolley. Um, he was very big into technology. He was trained as an engineer. He got his engineering degree at Franklin College. What? <laughs> engineering taught here? Yes, because there was no Georgia Tech. Um, whether that is a good thing or a bad thing is up to you. Um, so Herb realizes that he has made some mistakes in the park, and so he needs, he needs a broader vision. And so he reaches out, brings Olmsted down, um, and they have many, many discussions. This is a topographic survey from 1892 of that 1,400 acres. It used to be part of the curriculum to at least play with engineering equipment and try to learn something about that. I think that now is no longer part of any curriculum in any design school, which I think is a shame because Olmsted was trained as a surveyor and it comes in handy. But to create a topographic survey of 1,400 acres is no small feat. And each one of these squares, they are taking measurements on each one of these things and building this topo. So um, this is Moreland Avenue heading towards Little Five Points and John Pink's daughter. Show of hands, quick. Um, and the vortex, you see, I know the bars as well as the anyway, Barcliffe Road. Uh, Callanwall, the famous historic house, is about here. And Decatur is off to the right. North is up. Um, there are two streams that run through this property, and they flow north. I've had an argument with a client about water only flowing south. <laughs> water flows downhill, just to repeat. <laughs> the two creeks here are tributaries of North Fork of Peachtree Creek, and they are roughly in here, and another one is in here. Um, the land is beat to death, and to advance I go to the right. To the right. Very nice. All right. So Olmsted, they come up with, Hurt had a couple of major um, requirements. I want to get from um, Moreland Avenue and what well, was Williams Mill Road. I want to get to Decatur, and so Olmsted, and it's it's a good idea for a landscape architect to do what a client asks, even if it's wrong. You, you tell them that later. So he creates this big broad avenue from west to east to get to Decatur, and then and if you think about the geography of the state, 
the strike, if you will, of the, of the mountain ranges runs southwest to northeast. And that strike is, is, you can see in the land here, in the folds of the land, that's the general direction of these side streets. Olmstead has picked out the stream bottom land and reserved them as either lakes or parks. Oh my God, even without, without a FEMA map, he was already saying, don't build in a floodplain. And this is to quote Edward Gardy, who would build in a floodplain but a fool or a farmer? It's a good point. So Olmstead has set these aside. He's also set aside this thing that I often remark at, sort of looking like a litter. This is a forest reserve that he, from the very beginning, from 1892, that was always set aside as a, as a reserve. This big block right here was land that Olmstead wanted Joe Hurt to buy, and the seller would not sell. And it was, his name was Colonel Harrison, and the land is now partly Fernbank Forest. Uh, that was not Colonel Harrison's intent. Colonel Harrison wanted to create a road to Decatur. They went through his property. He wanted to subdivide on his own. A little known fact. Um, <clears throat> Harrison Land admitted, and Clifton Road uh, was also a pre existing turnpike. So Olmstead is agreeable, and he's saying, This is what you want. I got a better idea. And then this slide's a little dark. Um, this is a roadway that still does what Olmstead, what Hurt wanted, which is to get from west to east to get to Decatur, but he split the road into two parcels with a park that runs down the middle of it. It's more than a median, it is a linear park. You can see that the roads, Briarcliff, uh, Springdale, Oakdale, Goldwater, SOL is the way to remember that. Um, and then he's still got the park system and the lakes along the floodplains. Um, Deep Dean is still, he's changed the form a little bit, but still that intent of preserving Deep Dean is, um, is top on his mind. In this corner is a tabulation of the value of all the land. How many acres are all set aside in all of this land? Because the developer is very sensitive to this, I'm trying to sell lots here. I'm trying to make some money. You're killing me with this stuff. Not only do I not get to sell the land, I have to pay the money to develop it. So, you know, what are you doing to me? So, Olmstead convinces her to build this part. These other parts, a lot of people say, no, 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 her didn't want to build the lakes because of expense or because of concerns about malaria. It was Olmstead's concerns about malaria. Hurt was going, we don't have malaria here. People bring it in when they, you know, they come from Charleston, <laughs> um, Florida. <laughs> um, but we don't have a problem with malaria, but Olmstead did not want as part of his legacy creating a miasma. Um, that's an old-fashioned word, usually associated with Washington, D.C. and Foggy Bottom and the, the area where the tidal basin was built. So they omit this, and they omit the parkland there. But what remains is the 45-acre park along Postelian Avenue. So this is a blow-up of uh, the area where this is Peavine Creek, um, showing the lakes, showing this is Shadyside Park, Delwood Park, and Deep Dean. Um, you can see the divided roadway so that um, there were houses that lined the street. This was to be what Olmsted called a casino, which he could have called a country club. It was not a gambling casino. It was a communal gathering place. Um, and yeah, probably enough said. Oh, one of the other things about this topo that is wonderful is uh, they annotate it. Um, there's also too much to say, but anyway, there's a granite outcropping right here. The elevation of this bridge it's about 1,100 feet above sea level. It's really quite high. Um, all right, so this is the graphic that you always see, right? This beautiful lithograph is 1905, and in, in this has confused historians, it's confused neighborhood activists, it's confused opponents of neighborhood activists <laughs> that say Olmsted was a draft dodger, 
Olmsted didn't design you know, Druid Hills because here's this. And it says Olmsted Brothers right on it. But those boys were not plagiarists. All they did was, so before the SEC, there were things called financial panics because there was nothing governing uh, private industry or the banking, you know, banking sector. And so in, in a panic, um, like in Russia today, you would go to the bank and get your money out as quickly as possible because the value of the dollar was collapsing and you would have no resources. So the construction of the project stops. They dust off the project almost 10 years later and the other part of this is, Herb knows somebody's going to go off and try to buy land up here with the cheap seats. No, no, no. You're going to, this was Olmsted saying, that instead of building 100 foot lots along Postelian, let these be three to five acre lots, attract the right sort of people, which is um, wrong today in so many ways, but still it was attract the wealthy, and once they, uh, they build their properties here, it will attract everyone else. So you, you sell the most valuable land first, set the tone for the whole neighborhood, and then the popularity will spread. And don't release everything, and don't sell all the tickets first. Sell the most expensive tickets to the concert first, and then, um, then sell the cheap seats later. So this was, a, in a sense, a marketing document, which was to, to um, keep this in the mind of the public. All right, all right. Say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, right, right, right. Sorry, I couldn't see this one. Yeah, so you get the, the combination or the, the contrast between the single road, what the developer asked for, give it to him. Then show him the better idea. Um, and, and, and he'll love you for it. Um, but this is what David Spinner says, the best graphics always wins. This is what people remember, right? So, so you're out here at the 45, 1400 acre world. Now we're down to five acres and we're down to three acres. This is um, Springdale Park. This is the westernmost part. Constellian is here and Brightcliffe Road is here. And you get, this is the local road, this is the major road, which at the time was only two lanes. There was also an electric trolley along the edge of this, and this is one of the things that Olmsted that truly inspires me, is, um, <laughs> I'm trying to be politically correct. All right, I'm going to just jump in, too late. Um, Olmsted appreciated engineering. He depended on engineering, but in the world of engineering and aesthetics, aesthetics wins. Engineering is our servant. Aesthetics rules. Let the engineers help us make something work and be beautiful. There. All right. Um, and in today's world where design firms are being sold to engineering companies, it seems to me it's been inverted. All right, so this is what a planting plan in about 1903, 1905, look like maybe 1908, yeah, 1903. So, you know, people that, the, the, those that say, the Olmsted firm, they never, you know, it was, it was nothing more than this pretty graphic, nothing ever happened. No, a developer does not engage you to go to this level of detail unless they are pretty certain that we're gonna build this stuff because there's a lot of work in this. Now, this sort of nomenclature for a planting plan, and Alan taught me planting design, <laughs> and it was very um, rigorous. No misspellings, which was to get the license at the time, every plant name had to be spelled right. And to get any kind of a piece of grade from Alan, every plant name had to be spelled right. So this code is arcane, I mean, cryptic, at, 44 225s. And so we finally found a Rosetta Stone that helped us understand what this is. So here's the plant list. We've got the number, and then, and then the, 
then we also have the, um, the fact that plant nomenclature changed rapidly and continuously and continues to do that. So Lacotia fontanasia is not that anymore. And so what you have to do is go find, and there's not a particularly great example. Oh yeah, here we go. Southern Red Oak. Quercus, anybody, anybody? Uh, this one, this one is Quercus Scylla Quo Rostrum. Yeah. So we had to go through the plant list, and and, and this um, this is not a restoration; it's a rehabilitation. And and I I have to do this for Lucy and for others. Four ways to treat an historic design landscape. Anybody? Anybody? Preservation, restoration, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. This is not a This is not a restoration because number one. We don't know exactly what got planted. And we, to be a restoration, we would have an electric trolley along this park. So this is a rehabilitation. It's a rigorous rehabilitation, but it's a rehabilitation. We also eliminated the paths that went to the trolley shelters because you do not want to direct a pedestrian to try and cross possibly an avenue mid-block. You don't want to do it, um, not at all. One of the other things about this is for this is the design for individual lots. The P is for a paddock. The VG is for a vegetable garden. There is no old folks down the street. There is no green grocery down the street. If you want vegetables, you are growing them yourselves. And because you may not have a car yet, you might. You probably have a horse and a buggy. And when you bring that buggy home and you bring that horse home, <coughs> somebody's got to pick the hooves of that horse. Otherwise, they will founder and you will not be able to take that horse to the shop and get it back with a lunar horse. <laughs> so if you, anybody's picked the horse's hoof, uh, you, need, you need a fork, not the stall, you need a place to turn that horse out so you can get that stall right. All right, so, um, so this is a shot of Springdale. This is that first park here looking into virtually. And you see the cross street of this is Springdale coming uh, north to south, south to north. Um, so in this image, and I did, didn't spend a lot of time gathering the before pictures, I'm going to go back. This particular park was badly abused. A, a playground was built right in the middle of what Charles Beveridge would call the Olmsted Scholar and editor of the Olmsted Papers, called the Olmsted Vista. And and you know, so many people experience this park from their car. And that is not the way to experience any park, except maybe, well, it's no way to experience the park. George Washington Parkway, it's a great way to experience that. Um, Blue Ridge Parkway, all right. Get out of your car, park the car, get into the park. When we built the paths into that park, all of a sudden we found People felt welcome. It was like a handshake. It's like, get out. We're actually meant to be in this park, whereas before they weren't quite sure. So one of the things we did was we replanted the plant, the plant masses that may have been gone by 1930. There's a letter from, so Lucy and Alan have at least this in common. They both received a grant from the Peachtree Garden Club for the Mule Rig Traveling Fellowship. So the Peachtree Garden Club, um, one of the, the editor of the Garden History of Georgia, 1733-1933, um, lived at Drew Hills. She writes to the Olmsted firm going, about 20 years ago, I think you all were involved in making this place one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in Atlanta. There's so much wrong with that sentence. <laughs> she thought they did. We weren't sure. And it was only 25 years. And so the, the invisibility of the field of landscape architecture at that period of time, or the amnesia that the designer of Central Park had been involved here, at that point it had become myth. And they responded, and she was like, I haven't talked to anybody about this. It's like, lady. 
tell people so they don't come back at that point in time. They were, she was getting ready for them to come to the Garden Club of America and have their annual meeting in Atlanta, which was a big deal. And she doesn't get the Olmstead firm back. And, uh, and so there was this already within a generation, the threat of Olmstead's environment was starting to fray. Um, in another generation, um, the Georgia Department of Highway, the Georgia Department of Transportation was even uh, more aggressive about it. So this is a view from here, looking into this. I originally paired this with the Riverside because in Riverside, it's largely a flat landscape, and the variety that he creates in the landscape is through that curvilinear, that paisley, that's laid down across something almost as flat as a dining room table. This, I, I picked this picture with the car there because like the four cross streets in Central Park where the roads are depressed so that you have that scenery, the view across that as a continuous landscape, he doesn't suppress the road, but he embeds the road in plant masses so that if I hadn't, if I'd waited another second or chosen a different slide, you wouldn't know that there's a road there. But you were actually looking from the first park to the second park, and way in the distance, thank you, Vitol Rubczynski, is the third park. Uh, this is what um, Georgia GDOT proposed for, and we went. Uh, I could go back to that other slide. I don't think I need to. Shadyside, Delwood, and Deakin Park. Here's Fernway Forest. This is what the purple spaghetti, that is what GDOT um, thought was progress in 1968. Um, and, you know, I don't know if this was all flyover or if they were just going to come here and fill this. This is, this is landscape that is basically picturesque. The other five parts of the, in the pastoral tradition, this land is rough. There is probably 50 or 60 feet of elevation change into the middle of this 22-acre park, and GDOT was just raping it. There's no nice word for it. Um, I, you know, these, you know, the co-author of, of that book, um, her house is right there. <laughs> and this this was stopped through neighborhood, neighborhood activism, um, which went on for 68 until 80, almost, almost 20 years. Um, this is what Deakin Park had become. Um, this is what happens when you have fixed goals on an athletic field. Um, and you know, the people that think that all pavement is horrible. This is at least as compacted as asphalt. Um, the rule sign I picked out, no hoofed animals, because, you know, if you bring your goats to the park, that's wrong. Um, so this is what Deep Dean looked like, the invasive exotic explosion, um, erosional scour pits. Um, this is the, where the electric trolley had been, a right away that Georgia Power still owns, um, blessedly. Um, but the power line um, expansion required the forest edge to be sheared repeatedly. Um, this is that area now, um, which we call the promenade along Costalian. Uh, these are the paths that we built in the park and across sort of gorges. Um, it's not a restoration, it's a rehabilitation. We tried to be within the Olmstead aesthetic. Um, this, this one, I love this view for many reasons. Um, one is it puts the path at a distance from the street where people actually feel comfortable because you could actually see the beaten earth where people wanted to be. The power lines are all put underground. This was paid for by, in part by GDOT and in cooperation with them, in coordination with them because they were going to put a future uh, storm drain under the road. Not the panic of 1893, but the recession of 2008 stopped that project. When they picked back up the pencil, the millipede had lost its head in the back legs, then never knew what happened. They decided, no, 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 we can't put the storm right here. We have to put it here. So we have to tear all that out, build the storm drain, 
And then, and these trees are now 40 feet tall. Um, they're tulip poplars, mm -hmm. um, and in part we wanted to, you know, Olmsted is at Asheville in 1893. Here we are in Drew Hills. Tulip poplars are the most, is probably the dominant species in Deep King, and we use those as a street tree. And they have um, for a 